position that? Well, that's obvious true that uh, the people approach to privacy is as different as you can imagine. So there are the people who are very keen on uh, the private information and there are the people who are building their social position with uh, um, uh, revealing information which is not only private but we can say that it's uh, part of intimacy of the person. And definitely uh, also the data protection authorities are the last ones uh, in, in the world who would say you cannot do that. Uh, that's something which is a part of our information autonomy that we have. And uh, uh, at the same time, we have to be in mind the fact that uh, the society is not only those people that we uh, see in the media, and these are not only those people that are seen uh, in the web services and in the social services. Uh, we often say that, first of all, people are f uh, keen on privacy, but at the same time they are revealing information about themselves. Secondly, that the new generation is not taking care of privacy at all. And both of that uh, is actually a myth, because uh, if we think about the people who are revealing their privacy in social services, yeah, that's true, of course, but if we ask ourselves here in this room how many of us uh, pr publish the information about their children or about uh, the places where they are, uh, their financial situation in the social services, I guess most of us would say, no, we, we don't do that. So it means that uh, if the persons are informed well what can be done with the data that they reveal, uh, they have, let's say, a little bit more moderate uh, way of uh, revealing it. And secondly, we often say that uh, the teenagers now don't care about privacy at all, and uh, they say it themselves quite often. But every time I meet a teenager who said it, uh, I'm asking him, do you allow your parents or your teachers in the school to be your friends in the social media, in the, in the social networks? And of course they say, no, 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 there, there are the borders, there are the borders. Okay, and that's actually the question. The question is, are you really informed what is done with your data? And secondly, do you really agree on that? If you are informed and if you agree, then it's a part of your uh, autonomy and it's a part of the things that you can do. So that would be the, the initial uh, statement as far as the future of the privacy is concerned. Of course, it will change. But uh, one more sentence. It's often also, uh, I often hear that the privacy is a new phenomenon. It didn't exist in, the, with, uh, in most of the history of our culture. It just appeared in 19th century and it's uh, probably, that's the end of the privacy right now. So my, my question is then, does it also uh, go to human trafficking? It's also quite a new phenomenon that we don't allow slavery, that we don't allow human trafficking. Uh, just 150 years ago that was common among the nations. Uh, the other common things were the lack of democracy, uh, the inequality, uh, the gender inequality. So these are these new phenomenons that we find out as a part of the key developments of the 20th century. Um, as we have two representatives of global acting companies here in the panel, I would like to ask you for your general view on Europe. Um, are the Europeans more sensitive in data privacy than the rest of the world? Mr. Sardange? Um, I mean, my perspective is I don't necessarily think so. I think, you know, the rest of the world, everybody has privacy concerns and, and you do hear about it. I think it goes back to a little bit of a caveat off of what Chad was just talking about is that shared responsibility idea, whether it's a con from a consumer or from an enterprise standpoint that, uh, you know, individuals or enterprises need to understand, you know, if they're going to use either social media or cloud services and so forth, they need to understand what is the privacy policies with those systems and services and then what is the responsibility of the individual to decide, again, to the point that was made earlier, how much information do you put out there, how many people do you invite to share with that, that content and so forth. So there is, um, there needs to be a focus on both sides, obviously from a provider standpoint, but from a consumer standpoint, there are responsibilities that they need to, to accept and understand and, and know what they're using the service for. Let me ask uh, a little bit more precise. As we already touched the point that there might be cultural differences and cultural um, sensitiveness regarding data privacy, um, it might be very difficult to cope with it uh, if you are acting on an international or on a global basis. Correct. And, and for a company like ours where we're global, um, we need to be sensitive and aware of that. But then that's also part of the, uh, 
the openness and the you know the scalability and the elasticity of cloud computing is that it there has to be a common level of of capability across all of the all of the services and so that's the that's the balance that as a provider that you have to understand is that you may or may not be able to support you know a single individual's wants or needs because you're looking at the collective that's the that's the advantage of cloud computing and so that is something that we do balance is look at what is the global view as it comes to privacy and, and where's the bar that we have to measure to. Mm -hmm. Mr. Schultz, I, I would like to ask you on your view um, regarding <laughs> the level of knowledge and experience with the users. What we see so far is that the, the use of IT in general is very much um, what people um, do on their own. There is no education behind. And if you allow me to go for a comparison, if you want to drive a car, you first have to, to get a driver's license. And to get this driver's license, you have to prove a certain level of knowledge. You have to do a test to achieve that driver's license. So there is the, 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 the idea behind that a minimum level of expertise is known before you ever can uh, enter a car. We don't have that in place for IT and uh, for, the, for, the, for the handling of privacy in IT. Would you, would you think that, that a better education, both at schools or even in business, uh, would help to, to improve the responsibility of the users? Um, if I see that uh, my kids are much more knowledgeable on IT than I am, I'm not sure who's the one who needs the education. And I pretend to know a little bit about it. Uh, I do think that, uh, yes, uh, IT is probably going to be an integral part of education in the years to come. But um, even more so, I think that, uh, and I'm happy to hear that uh, persons in charge of data protection, like our Polish uh, friend, seem to share the same view. Um, what we need to do is, I think, that um, we need to extend the scope of the discussion a little bit. Because the scope of the discussion, it seems to me, is nowadays exclusively on data protection. Whereas we should bring into the discussion also the concept of data sharing. And then we need to strike the right balance between the two. And I think this is also about empowering the consumer or the user. And when you say empowering the consumer or the user, you come back to education uh, very uh, quickly. In the same context, um, I think we have to broaden discussion as well when it comes to the uh, now almost famous right to be forgotten, which is more a right to erase in my eyes, but which we have to balance out against the right to know, in particular for historic reasons. We are shocked when we see the, um, in, in, in the north of Mali the um, Islamic guys destroying the manuscripts which we're spending money and money to keep, whereas at the same time in the internet we want to erase everything that is produced. I'm not saying that uh, there's a common ground between what is happening in, in the north of Mali and in, um, uh, in the internet, but I'm just trying to put it into uh, perspective. So I think if I'm coming back to your question on education, I think we need to broaden the scope of the discussions, bring in the sharing concept, and not only the concept of the consumer who needs to be protected, sometimes against his own will, uh, and uh, we need to balance um, the right to erase with the right uh, to know. And then I think um, that's another point, and my final point. Um, from a legal point of view, I think that national, national solutions do care some value. And we've seen that for businesses, they do care some value because the bankruptcy example which was given uh, by the CEO of Systemat and by the minister before shows that national solutions can add an additional layer of security. Uh, at the same time, I don't think that they are sufficient. And um, at the same time, I'm also convinced that uh, European solutions are not sufficient. So we need to find something else. And that means that we need to bring together different uh, perceptions. Uh, we are currently working on a project at university which we hope to obtain the funding pretty soon, which we developed in the uh, what I would call the pre-Snowden age already, which was about um, 
looking at data protection from a technical and legal point of view from both sides of the Atlantic and to see how those could be brought closer uh, together. And uh, I'm a little bit concerned also coming back to what is happening in the EU. Yes, we need more harmonization in the EU, but I'm a little bit concerned that we're faced with a text where we have, and I'm quoting a figure which is probably wrong, where we have 5,679 amendments going on. Now I wonder uh, who uh, still knows what we are talking about, and at the end of the day, how can you convince the user that this is a good text if you're discussing 5,679 uh, amendments. So there's a real issue of acceptance here about this piece of legislation. But again, I think it's not sufficient, but we can perhaps go into that at a later stage. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Schulz. Um, this also leads me to, uh, to a question. Um, if we, uh, if we look to uh, the global players, there are, uh, it is recognizable that some of those are adjusting much more to the European national regulations than others do. And uh, I recognize that Microsoft is very much adjusting to the European uh, regulations, even though Microsoft has often uh, been uh, in, in critics um, um, due to uh, um, their activities and uh, I, when, I, when I look to uh, the, the launch of uh, Office 365 a, a bunch of discussions started um, which I felt over exceeded um, um, the, the, the level of, uh, of, um, of uh, um, it, it, it became a, a, a hype in the media uh, somehow I would, I would like to, see, to hear uh, what your position is on how to deal with the national regulations in the various countries. I mean, as a provider, you are, you are in, a, in a difficult situation to, to comply to the national regulations in each single country. I think that is one of the concerns that we are having, given it broadly said, it, it was part of your beginning question, how do we see it in Europe and towards other uh, countries in the world. The fact is that we have to deal with a number of member states and also uh, what is seen for, from the European Commission. The fact is also that today we do not have one single digital market. We're speaking a lot about the, and at the anniversary of the uh, common market, the uh, marché commun that uh, is about 20 years. From the digital side, it's certainly not. So we have to cope as a global player with those uh, constraints, sometimes also legislations that are contradictory, that you can do something, you must do something in a country, you cannot do it in another one. We try to introduce this, as you mentioned, it with the introduction of a number of cloud services, we see EU model clause trying to provide, and we do believe that privacy is something important also for our customers, for our enterprise customers, but also for uh, the consumers in Europe as well. It is the biggest uh, economical area for us with uh, 500 million uh, citizens here, so we have to comply with it. That's certainly something that is, we believe, as a global player non-negotiable. We have to comply with law, so trying to adapt it. The difficulty certainly resides with the fragmentation that we, as Jean-Louis mentioned as well, having today in Europe. We had Today, it is a fact, too many different views are difficult to bring together. So uh, the challenge, and I think for Amazon it's the same, is bringing balance between a global approach and also something that is not only within European Union or the uh, economical European area, but also beyond and going in transit. Cloud services today brings the benefit, economical benefits also to the customer, bringing innovation if data can transit freely under regulated uh, aspects. If we're blocking it, the innovation will be blocked as well. So it's trying to find the right balance between what is feasible on one side and what is, uh, w w what is needed on the other one. It is also true for regulated industries, for those that probably the regulator needs to come up with specific regulations that there is a broad consent on what is feasible for citizens, for consumers, for enterprises, being it corporations, being it SMBs, and also being able to flow that information, making transit between different cloud providers, cloud technologies as well, and even considering what needs to be within and also beyond the European Union, so thinking about what I believe could be something of an approach like a shared data area like Schengen, we have for citizens to transit, but also for data to transit. So to have an SSD 
may be based, we are in Luxembourg on the Schengen model, where there is also for global companies the ability to flow data freely in a shared de data area where those regulations will be common. Today is, and I think uh, Luc Frieden mentioned it this morning as well, there are a lot of emotions about it. So yes, it is making hype uh, in number of uh, situations because it's a very emotional topic and trust is not something engineers can handle quite easily. So it is something on the relational part there as well and being able to cope on one side on the technical advantage that it's bringing today and we all believe otherwise we wouldn't be in this room that the cloud service are bringing technical and business advantages, the regulatory frameworks that are sometimes contradictory, but also the side of being able to bring that innovation with freely floating information in different areas where also there is legal certainty, and I think that is probably what is also the meaning of the law regarding bankruptcy in Luxembourg. It's certainly one of the aspects, but it's certainly more important for the customer to have that what I believe is the most important legal certainty. Now, what frameworks am I in? What are the conditions and what is going to happen if that case was to happen for bankruptcy or how it is with a regulated environment like AWS? Mentioned how we're doing it with Azure services or Office 365, that the customer or the citizens knows exactly. So giving that transparency in other reports, we're pushing also for the record, being able to bring transparency to the customers, to the citizens, and being then able to have a direct approach on how to bring those services. Thank you very much. Okay. Yes, please. Let's make one comment on what Thierry said. I think that if we're talking about common rules, uh, we also need to talk about enforcing common rules. So who's going to enforce these common rules? I don't think that we will have a European data protection regulator. That's at least not uh, the direction in which we are going. That's for Europe. And if we have a common set of rules, or assume we have one day a common set of rules between the US and uh, the European Union, who is going to be the body that decides on enforcement? Because enforcement has to do with interpretation, with application, with implementation. So we're not quite there yet. Okay. I would like to open the discussion to the audience. So if you want to raise a question, uh, please do so. Yes, please. Can we have a second microphone? What does it help if we have wonderful technical possibilities to make cloud sure and secure and so on, but the governments give uh, legal allowance or don't, uh, don't control enough the intelligences for sneaking around the networks for, for <coughs> uh, private, private data and uh, destroying the trust. Thank you. I knew it would come. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> I will repeat what we always said, what we had said, and what we continue to say. We do not give any government access, unfold, whatever, to our data systems. That is not true. Whatever press is writing, and that is a personal comment, I cannot know what the journalist is writing about his interpretation of a document we haven't written, about somebody else's interpretation of something we don't know about. We do confirm we didn't know about the intelligence called PRISM, uh, that was going on until it was mentioned in the press. We do not provide encryption keys to any government in the world, being it a European one, being it a US government, in the world, whatever. We obey two legally binding situations where there are court orders, subpoenas that are requesting, like every company, like every individual, we are submitted to law, so we have to obey those. If those laws are not the right ones, we are not writing laws. We're making techniques, we're making technology, we're engineers. So, in that sense, if governments, whoever they are, are sneaking on networks, not with our full cooperation, not existing. I would catch up with that question because I think that is a very valid one. Um, as we, as we discussed before, trust is a key subject, and as, as you just mentioned, uh, Prism and the NSA scandal was um, was not very helpful in this uh, building of trust. On the other hand, we recognize a certain ten tendency that in reaction to the scandal, um, national um, solutions are 
promoted. So as long as the data stay in my country, in, in the country, um, then the uh, prism uh, um, um, uh, problem uh, is not given. So that might be interesting for the one or the other provider who is acting just on a national basis, but it is, is that against... True? The, yeah, is that, that true that, that if it's in the national boundaries, it's not open? The internet was not designed that way. Yeah, I know. If I'm sending an email to Jean-Louis, I do not know what work it's going to travel. So the design of the internet was never meant on national frontiers. It's that, that from an engineering point of view, that's probably not true. It is an emotional reaction against saying, if I do it in my own garage, it will be safe. Is that garage safer than another one? Yeah, yeah. I think that is an emotional reaction. I, we saw the, the positions that the Brazilians uh, took last week. Is that more safe? Up to them to respond to that question. Probably not. That's my personal point of view. But it's an overreaction to a lot of fuss that nobody has examined on core what exactly was provided. I have not seen those documents. I was not the author of it. So it's very difficult for us being externally. And we cannot speak out what we have to do. So what is the reality? It is probably a balance between a number of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that was, uh, that was exactly the point I was making. We are clear that the cloud is not limited to any borders, of course, and the Internet isn't either. But there is a tendency on the market, and that is very much coming along with, you know, uh, dealing with the, with the fears of the users and reacting on it. Yeah. Is there a I absolutely agree with what Thierry said about uh, the idea of Internet as such, and, uh, uh, the, and the fact that... Uh, this nationalization of the uh, processing of data is actually against all uh, the n normal developments that we can, uh, um, we can see at the moment. But at the same time, we have to remember that we have another problem which was well seen uh, in uh, the uh, light of the PRISM scandal, which is the fact that some countries are differentiating uh, the, dat the freedom protections of their own citizens and those who are not their own citizens. And of course, I'm saying about the uh, United States. And that's the problem which is uh, very well visible for those who are dealing with, uh, um, with uh, freedoms, uh, uh, with, with rights, uh, with human rights actually in Europe, uh, that while this European approach and approach which is taken in uh, many uh, other countries uh, are saying about the rights of the human being, uh, these rights in the United States are only the rights of the United States citizen. And uh, the Amendment 4 to the American Constitution, which says about privacy, is uh, both by the doctrine, by the lawyers, and by the courts, are, they are understood as the rights of the citizens of the USA and those who are in the territory of the USA. So once again, we have the territorial approach to the uh, rights uh, uh, of the people. And this is something which I disagree as a person who is dealing with human rights. Uh, because for me, the rights of the people are the rights of, that are coming from the fact that they are human beings, not the fact that they are the citizens of Europe or they are the citizens of any other country, <laughs> any other country in the world. And let me uh, put one more remark to something which was said a while ago about these 5,000 something uh, amendments to the uh, laws that are right now under preparation in, uh, the, uh, in the European Union. We have to remember that these are two documents. That's the regulation and the directive, but it's true that most of the amendments are to the regulation. First of all, uh, on 21st of uh, October, the Parliament will be voting the so-called compromise proposals, which are coming out of this uh, 5,000 amendments. There are 3,500 as far as I remember, but anyway, it, that's a lot. Uh, so we know more or less what's going on. Uh, we can somehow handle it, and uh, both Digital Europe and uh, ADRI have been commenting all these uh, uh, amendments and com commenting the possible outcome that will go out of, uh, uh, out of them. And uh, a little bit ironic thing, while being among the people who are dealing with business intelligence, just 5,000 amendments, that's nothing. That's something that we can handle quite easily with the tools that we have uh, at the moment in our hands. Thank you. Actually, my point was, I mean, I mean I, have been negotiating directives and regulations in a former life, so I know how complicated it can be. But the, the point is that these regulations, at the end of the day, will only fly if they are widely accepted by the citizens. And my point is about acceptance by the citizens, because uh, if you create a big mess, it's much more difficult to 
have your citizens accept things at the end of uh, the day. I know that the process is there, that the process will work it, work it out, but uh, uh, you're not going to, a process with 3,000 amendments or 2,000 amendments will not end up in a clear-cut text, and it will create a huge difficulty uh, for those that are in charge, uh, worried at a government level or a regulatory level, uh, to make citizens accept these rules and to, 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 to get them through and to, to take this one step uh, uh, further. I know that you are perfectly happy for you to disagree with what I'm uh, uh, saying, but I think that there's, that there's a major issue here. We are already uh, at the end of our panel discussion, but I would like to ask you for a short uh, summary and probably you can uh, implement a word on what it, it means uh, that uh, with coming with big data or with e-commerce, the collection of secondary data, not personal data, but the indirect data of persons, um, what, the, what this impact would mean on data privacy. And perhaps everybody uh, could uh, close uh, um, 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 the session with uh, his opinion. Well, definitely uh, the development of the uh, internet tools, uh, business intelligence tools, and especially those uh, that are used in the business, so the, that are used out of the government, but they are used by the companies, uh, have influenced uh, uh, our point of view on privacy very hardly. And uh, uh, the things which we shall bear in mind uh, uh, for the discussion that we have at the moment are, in my opinion, three things. First is who has our profile and who is doing uh, the things with our profile. And the second, are we informed that such a profile exists uh, and somebody is adding also the secondary information, this uh, so-called predictive uh, profiles uh, to, to our uh, data. And the third, uh, do, is there the legal ground for that? And what is the legal ground for that? Is it the law that allows it? Is it the interest of the controller, which can be also the very good ground? Or is it the consent from the person who wants to be profiled for the purposes she, he or she knows about? I think the, the first point is, is, as we talked about earlier, policy and regulation alone is not going to solve this. I mean, as we just heard, uh, you know, what are some of the, you know, plausibilities, you know, beyond technology? And obviously, one of the big things, as we were talking earlier, is education, really education, edu educating the consumer of what their rights and responsibilities are, and then educating them on what technologies are available to protect them if they do feel that, you know, their privacy is being violated or they want to protect it. There are, there are technologies out there, and each individual has to be aware of and take responsibility for that. But uh, unfortunately, the, one of the things that if we do go to too, too much regulation, then that is going to stifle uh, innovation. So that's the balance that we've got to do and make sure that, you know, the consumer and the enterprises are educated on what their roles and responsibilities are, and then what are the technologies that maybe can advance that protection uh, beyond just regulatory and policy. Thank you. Yeah, agree with Tim. I think it's certainly important that the customer is informed, that he knows why data is collected, or what it's done with, and if he does not want it to be collected, that he has his option of not being targeted whatsoever. And as shall we say, being both the right of privacy and the right of being public. And that needs a, to be a balance that no regulator can solve, but the consumer as company itself can solve. So it is informing, transparent, and giving the option for the choice. <coughs> Two quick comments. One, I'm uh, pretty much convinced that in the near future we will have the technical tools to implement an efficient right to erase, which also applies then to copies and the like. That's one. And two, even if we have or when we have these technical tools which enable us to implement a right to erase, this doesn't solve the issue of the balance between the right to erase and the right to know, for example, for historical purposes. So if we're closing one debate, we're going to open the next one. Thank you. <laughs> That's, that is a real good uh, closing point because I think we could continue this, this discussion for a while, even with that point. Thank you very much for your, for your interesting contributions. Thank you very much for listening.